Hello, welcome to Rolled Worlds. I'm Sean Roberts, the writer, and I'm the only one with you today. Uh, today I'm just going to go over the world of Tanu and the races that exist in it and the cultures of those races. So if we look at the very top of the map, we have Corline, which is the land of the Corlinians, which is the undead. Uh, it's a big northern wasteland. The only information that many characters inside of the LARP or the, or the tabletop role-playing game know is uh, that it's northern wastelands, it's dark and scary, there's never really any sunlight, it's always snowing, it's a very difficult place to live in. There is one settlement above, um, above the land of Andoria, where the mountain ranges come together, right above that there is one settlement that still remains that uh, nobody knows who lives there. They've just heard of this settlement that is that is above the mountain range inside of Corline. Nobody's ventured too far north ever. Um, and, uh, and the Corlinians are undead, made up primarily of zombies and skeletons um vampires are are even undead but they're a special type of undead so they don't really count inside of the masses of undead vampires are usually one of the creatures that are controlling undead um the corlinians are either raised by what's called um natural necromancy which is a type of uh, magic created by a race called the Gwens, and they're a very rare race that live in the in the forest of Espazio, which is more down south on this continent of Trollum, which is also where Coraline is. Um, and that natural necromancy is uh, usually displayed through this very dark, foresty green. Um, color whenever people can see the actual energy of that magic being used and gwen necromancy doesn't um animate the dead and allow a necromancer to control them the magic is almost like a form of healing and resurrection um but it doesn't fix corpses it doesn't um it doesn't realign a corpse back together and give them all the parts it just brings the spirit back into the body that is there and and halts uh any continuing rot uh from occurring and and so and the people that come back into those forms don't um don't owe allegiance to anything Natural necromancy doesn't control the undead that it brings back. It simply just brings them back. Um, natural necromancy also allows the sentience of those souls back into their forms. And so uh, any Corlinian that seems to have control of itself, that is able to communicate, talk, and do all those types of things, are usually brought back because of natural necromancy. Um one way or another they they met a gwen or they met somebody who was taught by a gwen how to use natural necromancy um then there's uh corrupted necromancy which is the traditional kind of neon green um color and uh it's corrupted because there is a dark power that is uh harnessing this this form of necromancy and and is using it as their own personal power to con take over this world um for a short period of time a group of adventurers stopped on natural necromancy from occurring in the world by destroying um a queen of the zombies uh queen of the undead um when they defeated her, unnatural necromancy ceased. Even when failing terribly at magic, it didn't allow um, corrupted necromancy to come through 
and do its thing, which is a, a thing that happened in this world up until now, is that whenever somebody tried casting a spell, if they failed terribly at that spell, it would allow unnatural, corrupted necromancy a doorway in to whatever it is that they were doing, and it could cause unnatural necromancy to occur then in instead. So necromancy is kind of this very sketchy, scary magic to use because of that. Um, and they destroyed the body of, of the Queen of the Undead. Uh, but then after some time, after some months, the Undead started to become a problem again. And um, necromancy was making its way through uh, magic that was being cast by others. Unnatural necromancy causes those to be who are raised by necromancy to be under the control of whoever raised them. It doesn't bring the sentience back into the people that are raised. It simply it simply animates the bodies of those who have perished. So you don't get the soul back with them. Corlinian culture doesn't really exist because Corlinians who are brought back by natural necromancy are not very common, and so they don't really have entire civilizations of their own. They, when natural necromantically raised Corlinians exist in the world, they usually try to just blend in with an outskirt crop of a society they don't they don't usually try to be a focus inside of the society because they're afraid of persecution corrupted necromantic undead as i said are under the control of somebody else and so they don't really do anything of their own they just sit and wait it's assumed that there are countless corlinians in Coraline itself, simply waiting uh, on the beck and call of whoever is controlling them. They don't eat, they don't sleep, they don't really do anything to try to uh, survive, to thrive, or to build, or anything like that. They're just mindless monsters. We go a little bit lower. On the continent of Trollum, we come across Ondoria, which is the birthplace of all life on Tanu. Years and years ago, I started up a Facebook game where everybody played as a race country that existed inside of this made-up world, and at the time it was called Ondoria. Andoria was a small place, kind of a, a middle earth inside of the world of Arda, as Tolkien had it. It was just a small place on top of a very large globe. In Andoria, there were lots of races that were created to begin with. Many like the Flount, which is what the Merwin and and uh yeah, the mermaids were called at that time. There were the Slow, which were gargantuan-sized uh, sloths. There were the high mounts, which were huge rock people. The techites, which were steampunk uh, humans who would replace parts of their body with, with uh, mechanics. There were the tall, who were stone elves at the time. Uh, their their bodies were much more chiseled and, and rock hard. Uh, they weren't actually made of stone, but their bodies were very hard and firm and uh, difficult to, to break the skin of. There were the Feronians, which were medieval traditional humans who had a great bond with horses, which would... Um, end up later on creating the Furians as a subspecies, but um, the Feronians were the first in that line. 
There were the Mormocks, which were basically red-skinned orcs that were created. There were also the the Fae, which came into existence at that time, which were funny because they were very technologically advanced. Um, there were the Sasha Heath that were created at that time. Those are the dragon people. The dwarves were created at that time. And the Corlinians were created at that time. But the Corlinians came into existence as this uh, race of monsters that nobody was playing in the game. It was just this this bad thing that everybody, the undead that everybody would have to fight. And uh, after some time, the the players who were basically gods decided to abandon Andoria one by one because of the Corlinians invading Andoria. They spread out across the world, and that was one thousand in three years ago, before time started getting recorded. And uh, so the year is one thousand and three right now in the world of Tanu. Um, they started recording time when when, a, when the Great uh, Departure occurred, which was when all the races left Andoria and spread out across the rest of the world. And Andoria ended up becoming somewhat of a part of the northern wastes of Coraline instead. Not many people venture to Andoria. There are Many ruined cities there. Um, the slow were wiped out during the invasion. People believed the tall, who were the stone elves, as I said, were believed to be wiped out as well during the invasion. And and the fey at that time were wiped out, but they came back because they existed in another realm to begin with, the the fey realm. We go a little bit more south on the continent of Troll, and we get to the Northern Wastelanders Gauntlet. And that's just a small settlement made up of multiple races who have all collected together in this one place, and they consider themselves kind of uh, the guardians of the world from the Corlinians. They, they set up this, this encampment, this very large encampment, in the hopes that they can militaristically defend the the rest of Trollum, the continent of Trollum, from any uh, invasions from Coraline uh, over the mainland. And so far, they've done a very good job, and they, they hold off any Corlinians that end up um, coming through the, the continent mostly made up of Feronians, Qualics, and and I believe Sasha Heaths. Over near the Northern Wastelanders Gauntlet, we have a, the, the Caverns of Nested Wings, which is a very interesting place and was recently uh, made a much more interesting place by Ronan and I when we were talking about the goddess Niaya. The Caverns of Nested Wings uh, are the home of the Dwarves, the Sasha Heaths, which are the dragon people, and dragons themselves. The Dwarves have, the, have this wonderful symbiotic relationship with dragons, where um, the Dwarves build these giant furnaces in their kingdoms to do all of their blacksmithing, to... Um, to heat their homes, to do everything it is that, that dwarves do. Um, and the dragons end up building their nests directly above the caverns that the, that the dwarves live in. And these giant furnaces heat the eggs of the dragons that, that uh, incubate directly above them. And this gives the dragons the freedom to roam about and do as they wish. They don't need to sit on the eggs or, or be with the eggs to keep them warm and whatnot. 
they can go about and feel safe also because the dwarfs protect the eggs. And um, when a dragon is born from these eggs, the dragon actually comes down to the lower areas where the dwarves live and ends up finding uh, a dwarf that it ends up latching onto and it just kind of picks a dwarf and that dwarf and the dragon are now bonded for life or at least for the for the dwarf's life when it comes to time and the dwarf doesn't really have much of a say in it the dwarves and the dragons have a really great connection they end up being really great friends they don't view each other as as uh, owner and pet or 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 servant or anything like that the dwarf will only ever ride the dragon if the dragon is okay with it they they end up viewing each other as friends and um they've also at times viewed each other as lovers which is where the first sasha heaths came from was from dwarves and dragons mating but from from those first batches ended up coming breeding with other races as well until the sasha heaths became a very um distinct race of their own when they were in uh on doria the sasha heaths as they called themselves were were really just dragons at that time they weren't really uh dragon born like in dungeons and dragons they weren't these kind of half breed looking things they were um they were full blown dragons that just gave themselves the name Sasha Heaths and they lived in the world with others uh as a race. When they came here, the the humanoid race Sasha Heath ended up taking on that mantle, that name, when they first started coming into existence, and the dragons just called themselves dragons from there on in. And uh so the Sasha Heaths became their own individual race and for the most part they live in the caverns of nested wings alongside dwarves and they they intermingle with other races a lot more readily than the dwarves do the dwarves are much more uh isolationists and stick to them stick to their own um caverns up on top of the land though the the mountainous region of the caverns of nested wings is always in perpetual growth and change the goddess Niaya really likes the Sasha Heaths and the dwarves, and she blessed the caverns of Nested Wings with the ability to grow at an alarming rate because of a magical time um, that she ends up putting on the on the mountainous region to forever be moving very quickly. Uh, that way forests and whatnot grow and fall grow and fall within a day a day in the cavern of the nested on the cavern of the nested wings those mountainous regions is about the lifetime of a tree and so the speed in which you watch a tree grow in the caverns of nested wings is incredible and because of the life and death span of these trees these forests become huge and and these forests fall very easily and dwarves don't have to chop anything down in order for them to be able to harvest from this land they just have to go outside collect the wood that has just recently fallen and then they have infinite fuel for their for their furnaces for their blacksmithing and they are blessed by niaya because of this because they don't need to destroy the natural world that they're living in because of this perpetual growth and motion that the cavern of nested wings is in um nobody lives on the mountainous regions of the caverns of nested wings and neither does any animal life because it'd be far too difficult to live um amongst that forest everything would be changing and growing around you you'd never have a second where something isn't potentially about to trap you but luckily if you did get trapped you'd be stuck there for at the most a day before um before whatever was growing around you would just kind of fall apart but you could get suffocated which would be scary so the caverns of nested wings is an interesting place and nothing really lives 
uh, up there, and the dwarves simply go to the edges of it to collect wood and bring it down into their furnaces. And uh, the dwarves are, as I said, isolationists. They're very tough, but they're very caring about the the natural world and the natural life that exists inside of Tanu, along with the dragons themselves that they care very much for, and this great relationship that dwarves and Sasha Heaths have with each other because of their bond with dragons. Moving to the eastern corner of Trollum, uh, but on the top eastern portion of it, we have, it, al amongst the plains of prey, is this one city of Alluvia, and that's where the Alluvians live. The Alluvians are a race of elves that came from space. The Tall are pretty much the only race in Tanu that are like an elf before the Alluvians showed up. But the Alluvians are actually the Tall ones. The, the Alluvians are about eight feet uh, seven feet tall on average, and um, an eight foot um, alluvian is a tall alluvian. A seven foot alluvian is kind of the lower end uh, height of an alluvian. Of course, in the LARP, they're just average size like a person, um, just because we, we don't want people running around on stilts, tripping and getting hurt, being just one of the player character races. So the Alluvians are space elves, and they got here by taking two spaceships that they had. One was called the Hope, and the other one was called the Future, from their home planet of Alluvia. And they left it because they knew their son was dying, and that their son wasn't going to last much longer, and they needed to find a new home. And so they built these two giant ships, to be able to transport as much of the population as they had the ability to. And they ended up having to do a lottery on their planet, and it was completely random, so the most powerful person on the planet was actually left behind to die, and um, families were split up because it was completely random, and so it was kind of a, it was a sad time for them while they were going through all of this. And, uh... But they eventually left, and they used a type of technology that the Alluvians have called um, Void Energy. And the Void is a plane of existence inside of the cosmology of, of Tanu. And uh, the Alluvians tap into the Void with their, with their technology to be able to use it to help them transport themselves very long distances so it's like a teleportation technology that they have using the void and they bend reality with it um to be able to go across the the universe very very fast and the alluvians used the void inside their two ships they had these void generators that they had to be able to transport their two ships from all the way where they were uh, on Alluvia to the closest in, uh, habitable planet that they could find, and that ended up being this planet. And so they, they jumped through the void with their void generator ships, and they were supposed to get here in about three minutes. And one ship did, and because of their plan to get here in three minutes, they didn't bring with them food or water, no resources, because there was no plan for a... Uh, there was no concept of having to travel here. They were just going to be here. And one ship did get here in that time. And the other ship got here in that same amount of time, in about three minutes. But they... One of the ships, the Hope, ended up feeling like they had been trapped inside of the void for 500 years. And during that time, the Alluvians that were on board the Hope became what are now called the Duskites, which are pretty much dark elves. Um, the Alluvians are kind of like the Eldar inside of uh, Warhammer 40k, very scientifically advanced, and... Um, 
and then the Duskites are like the Dark Elves from just traditional Warhammer fantasy. And uh, because they lost their their technology during that 500 years, the ship ended up becoming like their entire world. And many of their own race became their food because they didn't have any, and they learned to survive uh, however they could on board these ships. And they became quite primitive and cannibalistic and warrior-like, and they ended up using the void in a form of magic instead of technology and it was very dark and terrible magic that they would use to be able to create small black holes and consume things with them and so the the duskites uh when they got here crash landed near the city of gartilia which was an island city of the main kingdom of Fer of the feronians and the Alluvian ship landed on the outskirts of Gartilia as well. And when they, a group of adventurers went on board the ship of the, the Hope, they ended up finding these terrible creatures that had come through uh, with the ship. Whenever the void generator accidentally kicked on, it would cause these creatures to, to show up, or they were going into wherever these creatures were coming from and so they weren't the adventurers weren't sure which was which so they all got off the ship and once the generator kicked off again and um the ship ended up kicking on again with the generator and it teleported the ship away to another spot on the planet which was the mount slumber which is in the sands of time we'll be talking about that next and the Alluvians ended up deciding to park their their spaceship in the fields of, in the plains of prey, and so they they set it up like a tower, and they end up turning their entire spaceship into their main city of Alluvia, named after the planet that they came from, their homeworld, and they're very scientifically advanced, but they keep this technology to themselves. Um, simply because they fear what people of Tanu would do with their technology if everybody all of a sudden had it. And so they, they only use their, their very scientifically, uh, technologically advanced um, stuff for whenever they feel they absolutely have to. It is used for the sustaining of their their water and their energy comes from the sun. They use a lot of solar and wind technology along with um, along with uh, their void generator technology that they have for the most part abandoned out of the fear of what happened with the duskites and um and yeah, besides that, they just kind of stick to themselves. And those who decide to leave the Alluvian nation and kind of uh, wander out into the world on their own usually end up abandoning their technology and deciding to live more in harmony with the way the people of this world live. And they become what are known as the Elves. And there are different types of elves de depending on like where they live in the world, kind of the way goblins are. Um, so they're, they're named after the type of terrain that they're used to living in. The Duskites, um, for the most part, all stay as Duskites. They're very um, closed off from the rest of the world. They're afraid of what is beyond their ship. Um, those who end up do venturing out are, are quite brave and, um, and wish to find something to, to live in besides the ship. They're, or they're either very brave or very desperate. And um, Duskites ended up turning Mount Slumber in the Sands of Time into kind of their new home. They've they've expanded out from the ship and have kind of claimed the entire mountain as their home. There's a big dragon that actually lives in Mount Slumber in the lower parts of it, 
and the Duskites actually worship this dragon um, as a god, and the dragon is quite happy to have these these worshippers. When it comes to their their style, the the Alluvians are very um, synthetic looking because of their technology that they wear, or they're quite natural looking if they actually claim themselves to be an elf, um, or they look very gothic and tribal.